just getting pixels, and the other is LiDAR that a lot of companies also use. And LiDAR gives you these point measurements of distance around you. One, one thing I'd like to point out, first of all, is you all came here, you drove here, you used your neural net and vision. You were not shooting lasers out of your eyes, and you still ended up here. <laughs> we might have. <laughs> so I mean, things went well. That's good for everyone. <laughs> so clearly, the human neural net uh, derives distance and all the measurements and the 3D understanding of the world just from vision. It actually uses multiple cues to do so. I'll just briefly go over some of them, just to give you a sense of roughly what's going on in, inside. As an example, we have two eyes pointed out, so you get two independent measurements at every single time step of the world ahead of you. Your brain stitches this information together to arrive at some depth estimation because you can triangulate any points across those two viewpoints. A lot of animals, instead, have eyes that are positioned on the sides, so they have very little overlap in their visual fields, so they will typically use structure for motion, and the idea is that they bob their heads, and because of the movement, they actually get multiple observations of the world, and you can triangulate, again, depths. And even with one eye closed and completely motionless, you can still have some sense of depth perception. If you did this, I don't think you would notice me coming two meters towards you or 100 <laughs> meters back, and that's because there are a lot of very strong monocular cues that your brain also takes into account. This is an example of a pretty common visual illusion where you have, you know, these two blue bars are identical, but your brain, the way it stitches up this scene is it just expects one of them to be larger than the other because of the vanishing lines of this image. So your brain does a lot of this automatically, and neural nets, artificial neural nets can as well. So let me give you three examples of how you can arrive at depth perception from vision alone, a classical approach, and two that rely on neural networks. So here's a video going down, I think this is San Francisco, of a Tesla, so this, these are our cameras, our sensing, and we're looking at all, I'm only showing the main camera, but all the cameras are turned on, the eight cameras of the autopilot. And if you just have this six second clip, what you can do is you can stitch up this environment in 3D using multi-view stereo techniques. Oh, well, I know it's, oh, there, there we go. <laughs> So this is the 3D reconstruction of those six seconds of that car driving through that path. And you can see that this information is purely, is, is very well recoverable uh, from just videos. And roughly that's through process of triangulation and as I mentioned, multi-view stereo. And we've applied similar techniques, uh, slightly more sparse and approximate also in the car. So it's remarkable, all that information is, is really there in the sensor and just a matter of extracting it. The other project that I want to briefly talk about is neural networks are very powerful visual recognition engines. And if you want them to predict depth, then you need to, for example, look for labels of depth, and then they can actually do that extremely well. So there's nothing limiting networks from predicting this monocular depth except for labeled data. So one example project that we've actually looked at internally is we use the forward-facing radar, which is shown in blue, and that radar is looking out and measuring depths of objects, and we use that radar to annotate what vision is seeing, the bounding boxes that come out of the neural networks. So instead of human annotators telling you, okay, this, this car in this bounding box is roughly 25 meters away, you can annotate that data much better using sensors. So you use sensor annotation. So as an example, radar is quite good at that distance. You can annotate that, and then you can train a neural network on it. And if you just have enough data of it, this neural network is very good at predicting those patterns. So here's an example of predictions um, of that. So in circles, I'm showing radar objects, and, in, uh, and the cuboids that are coming out uh, here are purely from vision. So the cuboids here are just coming out of vision, and the depth of those cuboids is learned via sensor annotation from the radar. So if this is working very well, then you would see that the circles in the top-down view would agree with the cuboids, and they do. And that's because neural networks are very competent at predicting depths. Uh, they can learn the different sizes of vehicles internally, and they know how big those vehicles are, and you can actually derive depth from that quite accurately. The last mechanism I will talk about very briefly is uh, slightly more fancy and gets a bit more technical. There's a few papers basically over the last year or two on this approach, it's called self-supervision. So what you do in a lot of these papers is you only feed raw videos into neural networks with no labels whatsoever. You can still get neural networks to learn depth. And it's a, bit, a little bit technical, so I can't go into the full details, but the idea is that the neural network predicts depth at every single frame of that video, and then there are no explicit targets that the neural network is supposed to regress to with the labels, but instead, the objective for the network is to be consistent over time. So whatever depth you predict should be consistent over the duration of that video, and the only way to be consistent is to be right. And so the neural network automatically predicts the correct depths for all the pixels, and we've reproduced some of these results internally, so this also works quite well. So in summary, people drive with vision only, no lasers are involved, this seems to work quite well. The point that I'd like to make is that visual recognition, very powerful visual recognition, is absolutely necessary for autonomy. It's not a nice to have. Like we must have 
have neural networks that actually really understand the environment around you. And LiDAR points are a much less information rich uh, environment. So vision really understands the full details, just a few points around. There's much less information in those. So as an example on the left here, is that a plastic bag or is that a tire? A, a LiDAR might just give you a few points on that, but vision can tell you which one of those two is true and that impacts your control. Is that person who is slightly looking backwards, are they trying to merge in, into your lane uh, on the bike or are they just going forward? In the construction sites, what do those signs say? How should I behave in this world? The entire uh, infrastructure that we have built up for roads is all designed for human visual consumption. So all the signs, all the traffic lights, everything is designed for vision. That's where all that information is. And so you need that ability. Is that person distracted and on their phone? Are they going to walk, walk into your lane? Those answers to all these questions are only found in vision and are necessary for level four, level five autonomy. And that is the capability that we are developing at Tesla. This is done through combination of large scale neural network training through data engine and getting that to work over time and using power of the fleet. So in this sense, LiDAR is really a shortcut. It sidesteps the fundamental problems, the, the important problem of visual recognition that is necessary for autonomy. And so it gives a false sense of progress and is ultimately, it's ultimately a crutch. It does give like really fast demos. If I was to summarize the entire talk in one slide, it would be this. All of autonomy, because you want level four, level five systems that can handle all the possible situations in 99.99% of the cases. And chasing some of the last few nines is going to be very tricky and very difficult and is going to require a very powerful visual system. I'm showing you some images of what you might encounter in any one slice of that nine. So in the beginning, you just have very simple cars going forward. Then those cars start to look a little bit funny. Then maybe you have bikes on cars. Then maybe you have cars on cars. Then maybe you start to get into really rare events like cars turned over or even cars airborne. We see a lot of things coming from the fleet and we see them at some rate, at, at like a really good rate compared to all of our competitors. And so the rate of progress at which you can actually address these problems, iterate on the software and really feed the neural networks with the right data, that rate of progress is really just proportional to how often you encounter these situations in the wild. And we encounter them significantly more frequently than anyone else, which is why we're going to do extremely well. How much data, how many pictures are you collecting on average from each car per period of time? And then it sounds like the new hardware with the dual, dual active, active computers gives you some really interesting opportunities to run in full simulation one copy of the neural net while you're running the other one, letting the other one drive the car and compare the results to do quality assurance. And then I was also wondering if there are other opportunities to use the computers for training when they're parked in the garage for the 90% of the time that I'm not driving my Tesla around. For the qu first question, uh, how much data do we get from the fleet? So it's really important to point out, it's not just the scale of the data set, it really is the variety of that data set that matters. If you just have lots of images of something going forward on the highway, yeah. at some point the neural net just gets it. You don't yeah. need that data. So we are really strategic in how we pick and choose and the trigger infrastructure that we've built up is quite sophisticated and allows us to get just the data that we need right now. Uh, it's not a massive amount of data, it's just very well picked data. For the second question, with respect to redundancy, absolutely, you can run basically the copy of the network on both and that is actually how it's designed to achieve a level four, level five system that is redundant. The car is an inference optimized computer. We do have a major program at Tesla, which we don't have enough time to talk about today called Dojo. That's a super powerful training computer. The goal of Dojo will be to be able to take in vast amounts of data at a video level and do unsupervised massive training of vast amounts of video with the, the Dojo program, Dojo computer. But that's for another day. I'm like a test pilot in a way because I drive the 405, 10, and all these really tricky, really long tail things happen every day. But the one challenge that I'm curious to how you're going to solve is changing lanes. Because whenever I try to get into a lane with traffic, everybody cuts you off. And so human behavior is very irrational when you're driving in LA and the car just wants to do it safely and you mm -hmm. almost have to do it unsafely. So I was wondering how you're going to solve that problem. One thing I will point out is I spoke about the data engine as iterating on neural networks, but we do the exact same thing on level of software and all the hyperparameters that go into the choices of when we actually lane change, how aggressive we are. We're always changing those, potentially running them in shadow mode and seeing how well they work. And so to tune our heuristics around when it's okay to lane change, we would also potentially utilize the data engine and a shadow mode and so on. Ultimately, actually designing all the different heuristics for when it's okay to lane change is actually a little bit intractable, I think, in the general case. And so ideally, you actually want to use fleet learning to, to guide those decisions. So when do humans lane change? In what scenarios? And when do they feel it's not safe to lane change? And let's just look at a lot of the data and train machine learning classifiers for distinguishing when it is too safe to do so. And those machine learning classifiers can write much better code than humans because they have the mass amount of data backing that. So they can really tune all the right thresholds and, and agree with humans and, and do something safe. We'll probably have a mode that goes beyond Mad Max mode to LA traffic mode. Yeah. Well, you know, Mad Max would have a hard time in LA traffic, I think. So really it's a trade-off. Like you don't want to create unsafe situations, but you want to be assertive. But that little dance of how you make that work as a human is actually very complicated and it's very hard to write in code. It really does seem like machine learning approach 
approach is kind of like the right way to go about it, where we just look at a lot of ways that people do this and try to imitate that. We're just being like more conservative right now. And then as we gain higher and higher confidence, we'll allow users to select a more aggressive mode. That'll be up to the user. But in, in the more aggressive modes, in, in trying to merge in traffic, there is a slight chance of like a fender bender, not a serious accident. But you basically will have a choice of, do you want to have a non-zero chance of, of a fender bender on freeway traffic, which is unfortunately the only way to navigate uh, LA traffic. It always reminds me of like LA Story. This movie is a great movie. Chad Dorshammer from Canaccord Genuity. When we look at the Alpha Zero project, it was a very defined and limited variable in terms of the parameters on that, which allowed for the learning curve to be so quick. The risk, or what you're trying to do here, is almost develop consciousness in the cars through the neural network. And so I guess the challenge is how do you not create a circular reference in terms of the pulling from the centralized model of the fleet to that handoff where the car has enough information. Where is that line, I guess, in terms of the, the point of the learning process to handing it off where there's enough information in the car and not having to pull from the fleet? Well, well the, the car can operate if it's completely disconnected from the, the fleet. It uploads the, the training that's you know better and better as the fleet, fleet gets better and better. So simply, if you disconnected it from the fleet, from that point onwards, it would stop getting better, but it would still function fine. Previous version, it talked about a lot of the power benefits of not storing a lot of the images. And so in this portion, you're talking about the learning that's going on by pulling from the fleet. I guess I'm having a hard time reconciling how, if there was a situation where I'm driving up the hill, as you showed and I'm predicting where the road is going to go that's coming from all of the other fleet variables that led to that intelligence. How I'm getting the benefit of the low power using the cameras with the neural network. That's where I'm, I'm losing. I mean, the, the compute power in the full self-driving computer is incredible. Uh, maybe we should mention that if it had never seen that road before, it would still have made those predictions provided it was a road in the United States. In the case of LiDAR, the March of Nines, isn't there an example I want to just get to your slam on LiDAR because it's pretty clear you don't like LiDAR. And this, LiDAR is uh, lame. LiDAR is lame. Yeah. That isn't there like a case where at some point nine 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 down the road where actually lidar may be helpful and why not have it as some sort of a redundancy or backup? So that's my first question. If that is true, what happens to the rest of the industry that's building their autonomy solutions on lidar? They're all going to dump lidar. That's my prediction. Mark my words. I should point out that I don't actually super hate lidar as much as it may sound. At SpaceX, SpaceX Dragon uses lidar to navigate to the space station and dock. Not only that we de SpaceX developed its own LiDAR from scratch to do that. And I spearheaded that effort personally, because in that scenario, LiDAR makes sense. And in cars, it's friggin' stupid. It's expensive and unnecessary. And as Andre was saying, once you solve vision, it, it's worthless. So you have expensive hardware that's worthless on the car. The, we do have a forward radar, which, which is low cost and is helpful, especially for occlusion situations. So if there's like fog or dust or, or you know snow, the radar can see through that. If you're going to use active photon generation, don't use visible wavelength because once you, with, with passive optical, you've taken care of all visible wavelength stuff. You want to use a wavelength that is occlusion penetrating like radar. So LiDAR is just active photon generation in the visual spectrum. If you're going to do active photon generation, do it outside the visual spectrum in the radar, in the radar spectrum. So like at 3.8 millimeters versus 400 to 700 nanometers, you're going to be have much better occlusion penetration. And that's why we have a forward radar. And then we also have 12 ultrasonics for near field information in addition to the eight cameras and, and, and the, the forward radar. You only need the radar in the forward direction because that's the only direction you're going real fast. We've gone over this multiple times, like, are we sure we have the right sensor suite? Should we add anything more? No. You had mentioned that you ask the fleet for the information that you're looking for for some of the vision. I have two questions about that. Uh, it sounds like the cars are doing some computation to determine what kind of information to send back to you. Is that is that a correct assumption? And are, are they doing that in real time, or are they doing based on stored information? <clears throat> so they absolutely uh, do do computation in, in real time on the car. We have a way to basically specify condition that we're interested in. And then those cars do that computation there. If they did not, then we'd have to send all the data and do that offline in our back end. We don't want to do that. So all that computation have us on the car. It sounds like you guys are in a really good position to have currently half a million cars in the future, potentially millions of cars mm -hmm. that are essentially computers representing almost free data 
data centers for you yes. to yep. to do computational is is that a huge future opportunity for Tesla current, that is current a, a current opportunity and and that's not really factored in for anything yet we have 425,000 cars with hardware 2 and beyond which is means they've got all eight cameras the right the radar and ultrasonics and they've got at least a, the Nvidia computer which is enough to essentially figure out what information is important what is not compress the information that is important to the most salient elements and upload it to the network for training so it's a massive compression of real world data you have these sort of network of millions of uh, computers, which is like massive data centers, essentially, that are distributed data centers for computational capacity. Do you see it being used for other things besides self-driving in the future? I suppose it could possibly be used for something besides self-driving. We've been super focused on self-driving. So, you know, as we, as we get that really nailed, maybe there's going to be some other uh, use for millions and then tens of millions of computers with hardware, three or full self-driving computer. Maybe there's like some sort of AWS angle here. It's possible. Hi.